So mud brick is a, a great material. It's essentially adobe. It's just mud mixed with straw or plant matter to keep the mud together. It's a great insulator. It's cheap. It goes up pretty quick. And they used it to build this communal uh, structure. Now, there actually is a lot of advantages to living this way. Uh, one, you have common walls, so that means there's less to build, but you can also make it defensive. There's no ground floor access to this entire building, which means that if you actually came upon this, all they'd have to do is lift up the ladders, and you would never, ever be able to get in unless you, know, you scaled the walls somehow. So we can see that people in the Neolithic are you know, already uh, have better defensive instincts than all seven seasons of The Walking Dead. When we get into this, we can see that there are uh, common walls, and there's kind of units that probably represent family units. But there's also open courtyards. Uh, these are where you could get air, but also where you could dump trash. <laughs> uh, and there's also community shrines. When we look at the individual buildings, they often have raised levels to the floors. You can see that here in this reconstruction. Uh, this might be pragmatic. It might be a place for sorting grain or just to get it up off the floor, or they might have some kind of ritual purpose. We don't really know. Uh, the ritual purpose, they were probably places reserved for offerings, either offerings of animals, and these were decorated with uh, animal horns, and you can see that in this reconstruction. Now this was built after the invention of ceramic, so we actually have some of the first ceramic sculptures uh, in the world come from uh, this site. This is one of the most famous. This is the Earth Goddess, or the Mother Goddess, on a leopard throne, although we're not entirely certain it's a leopard. The head has been reconstructed, so we don't know what the head of this thing would have looked like, but it's definitely fired ceramic. There's been a debate about whether she is pregnant or giving birth. I think the most important thing is She's clearly, uh, again, one of these figures that is emphasizing the abdomen, uh, the hips, the breasts, those things that are associated with childbirth and child rearing. And there is a trend to a lot of the goddesses in this region uh, that associates them with wild animals, with leopards and other things. It's kind of interesting. Men seem to be associated with things like cows and sheep and goats, domesticated animals, and women are associated with undomestic animals, wild animals, make of that what you will. But there does seem to be a general cult amongst Indo-European peoples throughout this region and Semitic peoples through this region where there is a worship of a great mother goddess. I was rather skeptical of this at first, but the more you look into it, the more evidence there is that this is, in fact, some kind of pan-cultural phenomenon to these people. And so there's some kind of mother or fertility cult going on here. Uh, we also have what might be the first ever history painting or landscape painting. On a wall was a fresco, a wall painting, and this showed a uh, double-peaked mountain. And in fact, there is a double-peaked mountain right nearby. And this clearly looks to be a kind of aerial view or schematic of, of the actual uh, village itself, and you'll notice that one of the peaks seems to be erupting, and in fact, the peak is a volcano, and it erupted around this time. So Shadow Hook is kind of an interesting thing because it was occupied and flourished for about 400-500 years, and then it was abandoned, and they walked away from it. And maybe that's why they abandoned it. Maybe it was because of an earthquake or a volcanic ex eruption. So going back to our map now, we're going to hone in on this area. This is the Eastern Mediterranean, and this is what we call the Levant. And so going back to our map of the Middle East, you can see the Levant is, again, the coast of Israel. Uh, so we have over here, just to get my pen. So this is Egypt and Sinai. This is Gaza right here. This is Israel. This is the West Bank uh, in Palestine. Then this is Lebanon here, and then this is Syria, and then up in here is to uh, you know, Turkey. This is the tail end of Cyprus here. And right here, just north of the Dead Sea, is a place known as Tel uh, Es Sultan, which is more commonly known as Jericho. And yes, this is the Jericho from the Bible. This city has an extraordinarily long uh, history of occupation. Uh, while it was certainly occupied in biblical times, 
this little mound here, and there it is. You'll see it right through here, and there it is right there. Uh, this mound, which is not you know terribly impressive when you look at it today, was um, the home of one of the earliest Neolithic villages, and it looks like habitation there dated to around 9,000 BC. So this was the this was after they had invented agriculture, but before they had invented pottery. So this is the pre-pottery uh, ceramic. And it has a, a few notable structures. Again, one of the things that indicates that you have a real organized society is you have defensive structures. So this is uh, one of the oldest continuously inhabited places in the world, and it has a watchtower, a defensive structure. We also find some plastered skulls from this time period. Looking at the watchtower, uh, it's funny because when you go to the site today, you actually look down onto the watchtower, um, but that's because buildings got built up, and if you have thousands of years of being built up, the watchtower is now at the bottom of a hole. But once upon a time, it was at the top of the hill. So all of the rest of this is human action that has buried it. It's kind of amazing. But it once was a tower on the top of a hill, and it had a passageway that went up to the top of it. Of course, towers are very useful because you can see there's the great modern grate covering the ancient passageway. You can go up to it, and if somebody comes up to the tower, you can easily throw rocks down on them and defend them, uh, defend yourself from them. We also find these plastered skulls. I mentioned these in the last class, uh, talking about how they represent this transition towards portraiture. These are human skulls, and again, this is an attempt to preserve the body. Uh, the preservation of the body for the afterlife is a major fixation for a lot of these cultures, uh, right through the Neolithic and onward. And this is also where we get the origins of portraiture. So it seems that they would have buried their dead for a short time, uh, where the body could rot, and then they would disinter the body, take the skull. The skull is where the soul or the, you know, the anima or life force of the body is believed to exist. And they actually went through a very elaborate preparation. These were actually sealed in bitumen. Bitumen is this tar-like deposit that you can get, uh, like asphalt, actually. They would seal up the interior of it, cover it over with a thin layer of plaster. And I mentioned that they would even put shells into the eyes because the shells are, are shiny like an eye and they're wet. You can see that they cared a great deal to get some of the subtle intonations of the mouth. Uh, the eyebrows are a little bit too sharp, perhaps. Uh, so there's a mixture of naturalism and stylization, but it is an attempt to give the person a permanent flesh. This is, again, very much like later objects like the Mask of Tutankhamun, where the goal is to preserve them into the afterlife. Some other Neolithic objects that are nearby, just across the river in Jordan, at Ain Ghazal, we have these uh, Neolithic figurines that are made from lime plaster. So this is, again, pre-pottery Neolithic. Uh, and these are rather broken up, but you can see they have shells for eyes. But they are meant to represent uh, figures, and they were intentionally buried. There is, in the ancient world, this association with the... Uh, things below the surface of the earth or the underworld. They represent the afterlife. And so burying these might be a way of passing them on to the afterlife. We generally call these things uh, votives. A votive is something that is given to the gods or to some supernatural entity. Perhaps they represented individuals, or perhaps they were kind of uh, simulacra. A simulacra is a, uh, a thing that is given as a kind of sacrifice. So maybe they represented a kind of human sacrifice. Well, now we're going to move north, and we're also going to move several thousand years ahead in time to the Neolithic um, period in Europe. So the period, the Neolithic period in Europe actually is a lot later. Uh, remember that technology gets started in the Near East, and so they're a lot more advanced. They have agriculture, etc. Uh, but they also, by the time we hit, uh, you know, 4,000, 3,000 BC, uh, they're going to have bronze. But bronze comes late to Europe, so we're still in the Neolithic period at this time. Neolithic Europe uh, doesn't have a lot of large communities. 
There's not anything even as large as Shuttlehuyuk or, or Jericho. They're going to be small villages. They're going to be agrarian. They do have farming. And they're going to have wooden structures. Not a lot of forests in the Near East, so not a lot of wooden structures. Instead, they have structures made out of mud brick or stone. But here in Northern Europe, they have plenty of wood, so they're going to have wooden structures. We also call this period the Megalithic period. And so if Neolithic means new stone, Megalithic means large stone or big stone. And it is the defining characteristic of these cultures that they have this overwhelming compulsion to erect mammoth uh, monoliths, just single blocks of stone. Most of this is going to be happening in this region, in the British Isles, in France, and in Spain. But we also see a little bit into Scandinavia, uh, but we're not going to find much uh, further than that. There's also a few sites in along the Mediterranean, but this is where most of this is going to be located. And so not surprisingly, we call this megalithic Europe, where we have this development where for nearly 3,000 years, we have people erecting large stones. So the megalithic period is from this period here. Um, Stonehenge has several phases of building. Uh, and is built, started at 4,000, but isn't finished until around 1600. It's hard to believe that that's a nearly, you know, you know 2,500 year old uh, structure over its history. Uh, and then we have Tarshan. Tarshan is a tiny little site. Uh, it's a temple on Malta. Malta is an island in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. Some of these sites are also in Ireland. Ireland's in the British Isles. Uh, one of the more important ones is Newgrange in Ireland. The Newgrange is a tumulus. This is a mound of earth. But inside this tumulus is a passage tomb. And the passage tomb is a long a passage, that's what it is, lined by monoliths. And at the end of it, it has a series of three chambers. And those chambers are covered with what we call a corbelled vault. They haven't figured out arch technology, so they just basically put one slab of stone on top of the other, jut it out a little bit until it gets close enough you can seal the whole thing off with a large stone. It works. Uh, it's not terribly strong, but you know, it doesn't have to hold up a lot of weight. As we get to the passage tomb itself, uh, there is a window, a kind of lintel, and then an upper part that allows light to come into it. And there is one day of the year where the light will shine directly down the passage tomb all the way to the chambers at the end. And that's something that's very significant, is we often see that there are astronomical alignments to these structures, and that they took meaning from the movement of the sun, the moon, and the stars, and the planets in the sky. Here you can see sometimes they're decorated with little spirals and other motifs. Here you can see that corbelled vault where the registers of stone are laid a little bit over the top of each other. There's also, and it showed up for a second. There we go. I'm not sure why that blipped out of there, but there's also a, a whole massive monolith that's covered with spirals and chevrons and diamond shapes out in front of the passage tomb itself. There's a whole series of these megalithic types of structures spread all over Western uh, Europe and the British Isles. Uh, one of the most common is called the dolmen. These are all Celtic words, and dolmen literally means stone table. Uh, the Celtics came into this region and thought that these were built by giants and that they were massive stone tables. You can understand that. But they're not actually ta tables, they're actually tombs. That there would be three massive upright stones the one on the back has fallen away here. And then the front would be filled with smaller stones. And then a large single slab of stone would be placed over the top. So these were uh, tombs above the ground. Here you can see where this stone has fallen away from the backside here. The other one was the men here. Uh, the men here is, again, Celtic. Uh, it's a Gaelic word for meaning uh, standing stone. And you can see how some massive some of these are. Some of these weigh in excess of 60 tons. Uh, they're just colossally huge stones. And anytime you see one of these, you have to realize that uh, there's actually a third of the stone is under the level of the ground. So they have their own foundations. There are whole fields of these standing stones in some locations. 
probably the most famous is at uh, Karnak. Uh, this is in Brittany. This is right across um, the English Channel from England. And you have just fields and fields of these stones stretching on for three kilometers. Uh, thousands of these upright stones in straight lines. The last form that we have is the cromlech. And the cromlech uh, literally means circle place. We sometimes call this a henge. Henge is an Anglo-Saxon word. Cromlech is a, is a Celtic word. Um, but either way, they mean the same thing. They mean a circle of standing stones. And we see circles of standing stones all over Western Europe, all over the British Isles, and also in a bit into Scandinavia as well. The most famous cromlech, or henge, is Stonehenge, uh, which is by far the most famous of these. And it's the largest and most elaborate of any in the British Isles. Uh, when we look at this, we usually only look at the center circle of stones. But in reality, uh, there's a lot more to this site than just this center circle of stones. This site is located in southern England on the Salisbury Plain. So if you fly into southern England, uh, on a broad, flat plain in the middle of Salisbury, you will find this circle of stones. And you can see from the satellite photo that it's actually a lot more than just that circle of stones. The circle of stones is only the very center of the structure. There's a huge pit, a huge circular ditch, uh, all the way around the exterior. And it has avenues. It has little places where you can look out. There are also several other standing stones out on the perimeter uh, where uh, things line up. The most important one is this one here. If you stand in the center, uh, this lines up directly over this stone and out this avenue, and this is the heel stone. The heel stone is located right there. This is it. This is the heel stone. And the heel stone is significant because it marks um, the rising of the midsummer sun. So on midsummer day, uh, the summer solstice, if you were to stand in the exact center of this circle and look out towards the, sun, the stone, the sun would rise directly over the top of that, as is demonstrated here by my expert drawing skills. And so you could cite that right from the center. So this is one of the foundations for understanding this site, is what we call archaeoastronomy. Archaeoastronomy is the study of ancient sites, archaeological sites, by looking through the perspective of astronomy. We know that uh, natural phenomena were very, very important to people in the ancient world uh, for a practical reason. Uh, if you plant your harvest, if you plant your crops too soon, uh, there's a chance they could be subject to frost. If you harvest them too late, they could rot. And so you have to know when to plant, uh, when to harvest. And the best way to do that is to look at the movement of the sun. Hopefully you are aware that the earth is on a tilt, and this tilt is what creates, it's tilted off from the main axis, and this is what creates the seasons. And so the sun actually moves through the sky relative to the background of stars. And what that means is that <coughs> every day, uh, as you move towards the midsummer sun, the days get longer. And then after you move past the midsummer suns, they get shorter. The four most important days in the ancient world would have been uh, the equinoxes, where the day and the night are equal length. <coughs> I apologize. Let me take a quick drink. Uh, you have the spring equinox, which happens in March. You have the uh, fall equinox, which happens in September. Then you have the winter solstice, which is the longest night of the year and the shortest day. And then you have the summer solstice, which is the longest day and the shortest night. And it's clear that all of these days were important religious holidays to people at the time. But it goes beyond just knowing when the planting seasons are. They actually uh, took great care at this site. If you look at this site, uh, there are really amazing astronomical alignments. Not only uh, does it align to the midsummer sun, but 
at exactly 90 degrees to the axis that looks for the midsummer sun over the heel stone here. So you can see this sights out towards the, the summer solstice sunrise. <coughs> at exactly 90 degrees, uh, it looks out towards uh, the most northerly moonrise and the most northerly moonset. And that is also lines up with a couple of other features that are exactly 90 degrees to an observation of the winter solstice. Okay. Now here's the thing, this only happens at this location. So at this location and no other location do these astronomical phenomena line up to be exactly perpendicular at 90 degrees. Uh, they actually tried to build an exact copy of Stonehenge in Oregon, but Oregon is, even though it's far more north than us, it's way further north, it's way further south than, uh, than England. England is way far north, and they couldn't make it work because it wasn't at the right latitude. So the people didn't just decide to build it here for no reason, they built it here because they knew this was a special place. This was a place where the alignments worked just right. That shows that they're, they're considering far more than just um, the uh, far more than just the seasons this had meaning to them so the earliest uh, construction was a ditch the ditch was actually begun sometime around 4000 BC it's quite old and then uh, the ditch was kind of a sighting that you could sight out from the center of the ditch to the exterior the next edition, which was maybe 3,000 years uh, BC, uh, was the Aubrey Holes. Now, the Aubrey Holes were discovered by a scholar with the last name of Aubrey, hence Aubrey Holes, and we really don't know what these holes were. Here, the artist has recreated this as the holes used to hold stones, and that they are the former foundations of stones that have since been moved. Another theory is that if you count these holes, uh, they actually line up for a cycle. There's 28 of them, and then there's a, another hole that has a different material, and it has chalk. Uh, and maybe it was filled with chalk and filled with a different kind of stone. And that lines up, you know, 28 days is about the same time period as a cycle of a moon. So they were using these to record the cycle of the moon. We're really not certain on that. The ditch gets enlarged, and it gets expanded over time, and eventually they start moving and putting stones in the center we start seeing uh, the construction of wooden posts uh, to measure things, and then eventually it becomes the site that we see here today, where we have uh, the center ring, uh, which is what we call the cromlech. The cromlech is built in a series of stages. The first stage was made with what we call blue stones. These are stones that are about eight to 10 feet high, and they're actually, uh, you know, taken from whales. Uh, and then they replace that with the, the structure that we now know, uh, and which is made out of sarsen boulders. These, and these are the trilithons in the center, and then the cromlech. And these are the ruins of what we see today. Uh, so you can still see the ruins of that embankment and ditch, uh, but the cromlech is there. And as you can see, most of the cromlech has been uh, you know, lost. It's now missing, uh, and only a few of the trilithons are still standing. So here is a kind of layout of what they imagine this would have looked like. Uh, here are those blue stones. Uh, the blue stones were originally probably in two rows around the center, but they kind of bent those and moved those around. Uh, and then and they moved those when they started putting in the trilithons. The trilithons just means three stones, and so you have three stones, a lintel and two upright stones, so that's why they're called trilithons. Again, nobody accused archaeologists of having a surfeit of imagination. Uh, and then eventually we have the cromlech, which is the kind of circle that goes around it. Uh, <clears throat> The blue stones are pretty dang impressive. Uh, the blue stones uh, came from Wales, which is quite far away, uh, and you can see by the scale of them that they're still quite large. Uh, they probably would have weighed uh, in the area of uh, you know five to eight tons, depending on the size, and you can tell that they were roughly shaped. Okay, 
So there was some shaping to these stones. These aren't just straight rough stones. Uh, the trilithons are made from sarsen boulders. Sarsen is a type of sandstone, and these were sandstone boulders that were scraped up by the glaciers back during the Ice Age and they just dumped on the landscape when the, uh, the glaciers retreated. And these came from up to 20 kilometers away, and the largest of these is nearly 60 tons. They're really incredible in terms of their scale. Here's another view of these trilithons. Here you can see them again. And this is as good a place as any to talk about this concept of post and lintel construction. That's the kind of construction they're using here. You can see that there are two vertical members we call posts and a horizontal member we call a lintel. Now this is a type of construction that we'll see a lot of places, but this is one of the earliest examples in human history that it continues to exist. You can build this, of course, out of anything, out of wood, and the width of your um, actual, uh, your width of your lintel is limited by the strength of the material. Wood is very flexible and very light, so you can build a, a broad lintel with that. But stone, you can only build these narrow lintels because stone doesn't have a lot of tensile strength. It doesn't flex terribly well. It has lots of compression strength. That means it, it doesn't crush. Uh, you can pile a lot up on it, but it doesn't have a lot of tensile strength. So let's get to the question. Everybody wonders, how was this built? The one thing I can say is it was not built by aliens. Uh, it was built by people, again, made from sarsen sandstone boulders up to you know, 25 miles away. Uh, there are some that are nearly 60 tons, uh, but the, those are the largest. But each is, you know, there are some that are 25 tons. Uh, and here are some of the sarsen boulders from the original quarry. Uh, the techniques for building this are pretty simple. You can use what's known as an A-frame crane. That is, if you run the ropes over an A-frame uh, made out of logs, this increases your leverage and allows you to lift it. You could also see that you have a weight box here to weigh the end down. The evidence is that they built a pit and the pit would uh, have the lower third of the stone erected into it and then through a series of levers and pulling you could erect it. Uh, the other thing that was probably very important was cribbing. Uh, cribbing is a very simple technique, you can see it here diagrammed here, that you get guys with a lever on one side and they basically lever up one side of the stone and you can lever it up maybe a few inches at a time here you see them using a lever and the stone lifts up and then you shove a log or a, or a stone underneath it on that side then you go around to the other side and you lever up that side and when you lever up that side it kind of levers up a bunch and then you can stick another log underneath it and you just basically rock this stone back and forth putting another log underneath it every time and it will slowly tip from side to side to side to side getting higher and higher by a few inches at a time until finally it's high enough that you can push it over the top of the lintels. Uh, you're going to hear a lot of things on the History Channel and on YouTube that say this is beyond the technological means of human beings. We could not have built it this way. All of that, of course, is unmitigated BS. It's not true in the slightest. And how do we know that? Because people have been doing this for centuries. As a matter of fact, uh, this is an example. Uh, right up until the 1930s, there was this uh, native tribe in the central mountains of Indonesia in Southeast Asia that was moving monoliths up to 50 tons. And they were doing it entirely with ropes and logs and levers with no modern equipment or cranes. And they were erecting these as monuments to their tribal leaders. And it's absolutely insane that they did it, but they were doing it. You know, you get 80 guys together and you get the logistics together and you know what you're doing. Uh, you can move just about anything. And I know because I've done it myself. Uh, this is my lovely wife and she is looking on uh, a couple of rocks that I rescued from some neighbor's yard. Uh, this guy didn't want his stones anymore. So I went over and with nothing more than levers and ropes, uh, I levered these up into my trailer and hauled them to my house. Uh, and they're now in my backyard uh, awaiting the building of my rock garden and my landscaping. And uh, uh, two of these I did just by myself. The other one I had my brother-in-law help. So that's a work crew of two people. Uh, each of these stones is probably about 500, 600 pounds. Uh, and, you know, that's just two people. Give me a crew of 40 and I can move anything. Uh, and you can too. So don't be intimidated by it. 
Uh, and again, other than the trailer and hauling it to the location, everything about moving it around the site, I did entirely by hand, by just by myself, with levers and ropes. It's really pretty impressive. Uh, again, the stones were roughly shaped, and it seems that they shaped them so that they would be a little easier to pull over logs and pulleys and ropes. Uh, and they also have this thing we call a mortise and tenon joint. That is, they didn't want these lintels to fall off the top, so they actually carved a socket. And the, you, have a, you have a tenon. This is this little kind of bulge here. Uh, that's what this is called, and it fits into a mortise. And so this is like a, you know, something fitting into a socket, like a Lego set. Um, bet you didn't know that what those were called before, but they're called mortise and tenons. And so this is the mortise, and this is the tenon, and it worked pretty darn well. Of course, there's been earthquakes and all kinds of disasters and Romans and knocking them down, etc. So they haven't, most of them haven't stood up, but the fact that any of them stood up is pretty remarkable. The last thing we can discuss is, you know, what was it for? Well, it's clearly uh, a kind of solar computer predicting seasons, but I think more importantly, it was built as a ritual site, as a temple. Here are people gathered watching a midsummer sun. Again, this was important, but people associated religious significance to it. And so it was probably built by a community of people. There's no one village or people that we can ascribe this thing to do. There probably were villages from all over the countryside that sent labor uh, to come and to build it. Here's a rather fanciful view of how it was used. There's some that even suggest that maybe it was roofed. I don't think many people think it was roofed today. Uh, Archaeology continues to work on the site and we continue to discover burials. It's um, uh, a very significant site. Some of these burials are hundreds of years after it was finished, and sometimes thousands of years after it was finished. Some of these burials were built at the time, uh, and we see evidence that there may have been human sacrifice at the site. We don't know. <coughs> but it's clear that it was a religious site. Uh, one of the things that we don't know is who built it. Um, we can say for certain that it was not built by Druids. Druids are the descendants of, well, modern Druids as a revival of neo-pagan beliefs, but Druids during the Celtic period are, are, were the descendants of people who came to the British Isles very, very late. They came in the Iron Age, and this is well before that. This is into the uh, Neolithic period. So these are pre-Celtic Indo-Europeans. And whoever they were, they, they're not there anymore. They were utterly replaced by the people who came later. Some people suggest it was the Wessex culture. That was a, um, a culture that uh, lived in the Wessex regions of, of uh, yeah, southern England uh, that uh, knew how to work gold and a few other things, but really hadn't figured out bronze. The other suggestion is that um, it was the, um, the Bell Beaker people uh, the beaker people are called the bell beaker people because they made these drinking cups that are in the shapes of bells. And so the, the uh, drinking cup is called a beaker. Uh, and th they may have done it. Uh, I think the thinking is today that the beaker people actually replaced the people who built this. Because it seems that once the beaker people show up, most of these monoliths stop being worked on and they end up being abandoned. So they were a new culture that came in and conquered the culture that built these. There is uh, some inscriptions on it. Story goes that uh, a tour guide was giving a tour of school children uh, through the site. And as he was going through, he said, hey, anybody got any questions? A kid raises his hand and said, yeah, what are the dagger and the axe about? And the guy was like, what? <laughs> and sure enough, you can see that there's this little inscription of a dagger and an axe head uh, there on it. And this has been tested and this did date to the time period. So if there are daggers and axes, that suggests that maybe this was a sacrifice site. There's one other um, monolithic site we want to take a look at, and that is in Malta. Uh, this is the site of Tarshan, or Tarshan, if you prefer. Uh, and it is a temple place that exists probably before 3000 BC. So it's a very old site. Now, Malta is a tiny little island to the south of Sicily. There it is. Uh, there, there it is, blown up. And right inside one of their main cities is Tarshan. And Tarshan is a temple complex. 
The temple complex is partially built out of monoliths, and part of it is cut right into the living bedrock. It's really cool. Here's a, a, a plan, and you can see that it has a series of entrances into these lobe-shaped temples that are all lined with stones, and that ultimately this goes right into the bedrock itself. Here's a reconstruction of perhaps of what it might have looked like. Uh, you can see that it's built out of just colossal stones, and it would have been roofed. There's a kind of progression of sacred space here, uh, and that's a very common concept that we see in later cultures, that the outer courts are for kind of uh, less important functionaries, and the most sacred spaces are reserved for the high priests or for the god themselves. So there's a kind of progression of space. Uh, one of the most impressive monuments is this. This is the opening lintel, uh, post and lintel construction. This is the gate into the main structure. Here you can see it, uh, and it gives a sense of the scale of this thing. Uh, this block is just enormous. But there's a whole series of these massive lintels and stones. Here, take a look at this stone relative to the size of these people. You can get a sense of how big it is. Here is the backside of that lintel we were looking. So this stone here is the backside of this stone here. So here we are looking into the temple, and here we are looking from the sanctuary of the temple back to the entrance of the temple. It's really quite astonishing. Now this also has massive vases, and these are not made from ceramics. These are actually carved from stone. So they carved out this boulder until it was the shape of a vase for offerings. You can see the walls are made out of large blocks of stone. Some of these are decorated in spirals. When you get to the inner sanctuary, the inner sanctuary is carved out of the living rock, and you can see they carved the ceiling into the shape of a corbelled vault. <laughs> that suggests that the original temple had a corbelled vault, and it's now gone. There is a massive statue at the location, monumental sculpture. This thing is over five feet high, and we only have the lower half of it, so presumably there would have been an upper half here. It seems to be a female figure, a uh, fertility goddess. Uh, it's a little bit debated of whether she's wearing bloomers of some kind, or if she just has a really bad case of cankles. I don't know. Uh, I suspect these are bloomers. But you can see that she has feet, and then again, she's quite broad, with emphasis on the hips. Uh, again, this is emphasis on the features that are associated with child rearing and child bearing but it shows that there is some kind of central cult worship and again the mother goddess is pretty ubiquitous all across the mediterranean and the ancient near east there was some kind of pan cultural phenomenon of worship of the mother goddess some people have taken this to mean that these were matriarchal societies that they were ruled by women i think that's probably a mistake i think the growing evidence is that they were patriarchal societies um, we sometimes misinterpret data. We see a female goddess and say, oh, well, these, this must have been for women. That's a really kind of simplistic understanding. I don't know if you know this, um, but the most uh, commonly invoked uh, saint in the Middle Ages for military victories was the Virgin Mary. She was extraordinarily popular. She was the champion of, of kings uh, and uh, military rulers. She was the personal protector of both Charlemagne and Napoleon uh, in, their, in their tradition. So the Virgin Mary, we don't think of the Virgin Mary as a military saint and as a saint associated with men and uh, military rulers, but she was. So who knows? Uh, this, this might be a mother goddess, but it might have been an extraordinarily patriarchal society uh, where women didn't have much rights. Uh, you know, maybe we're maybe we're looking at it wrong, but it does show that there were concepts of gods and goddesses, and central worship and hierarchy and uh, social stratification. But this is all before the existence of writing, so we cannot know for sure. We don't know the names of these gods or goddesses. We don't know the names of these cultures. We call them only after the names of where we found them, or silly things like if they had bell-shaped beakers. Or we really wish we knew more about that. But that's a good lead-in to our next lecture. Our next lecture is going to be about the ancient Near East and about the rise of the first civilizations in Mesopotamia, Sumer, Akkadia, Babylon. Uh, and in those cases, we actually know what they called themselves because of the invention of writing. So we're moving from 
prehistoric cultures, cultures before the invention of writing, into cultures that are historic cultures, cultures we know because of writing. But we'll start that up next time. Thanks for hanging with me, and we'll catch you in the next lecture. Bye-bye.